name is Alyssa Newton, and I will be teaching faith development in community. Right now, I serve a congregation that has experienced some rapid growth in the past four and a half years. And one of the questions that comes up for us over and over again as we see new people come in is who belongs? And how do we know? How do we know if they belong? Do they belong when they sign up to be a member or when they transfer their membership? Do they belong the first time they come to worship? Uh, do they belong after three times that they've attended? Uh, and I think this is something that a lot of churches are facing because how we understand which people are our people uh, and how those people are developing their faith in the context of our particular communities of faith is changing. This model is uh, one of the ways to help us do a better job understanding that uh, both in an internal direction, understanding our own churches and uh, who they are, their unique expressions of faith, and understanding in an external way who belongs to us, who, is, who of the people are our people. So faith development and community as a model uh, moves us beyond a paradigm of membership, membership being there are people who are members and people who are not members. Um, it assists us in connecting to a broad range of people who develop their faith in our church community. And it gives us a job. Our job, through the lens of this model, uh, as leaders in our congregations, is to meet people where they are and invite them to go deeper with us in the development of their faith. So I want to talk a little bit about what we are leaving behind when we move into this model, which is a paradigm, a way of looking at church and who belongs to church through the lens of membership. Uh, this is something we've used for hundreds of years in churches. That's part of the historical record. Churches have roles. If you do your ancestry, uh, you can go back and figure out uh, who your ancestors were by finding the church records of their births and deaths and marriages and funerals um, by membership. But it's binary. You either are or are not a member. Um, anyone who fills out a parochial report every year struggles with this more and more. Like, who is a member? Um, a membership paradigm assumes a willingness on the part of the people who are interacting with our churches to participate in formal processes and formal record keeping. And one of the realities is people are less and less into that, uh, into signing out on the dotted line um, and participating in formal membership. So it's outdated, um, and a membership paradigm really lacks nuance because of the binary nature uh, of it. That, that either in or out, um, either member or not a member. The model that we're going to learn in a moment moves us into a practitioner paradigm, our way of looking at the people who interact with our congregation as practitioners, practitioners of faith, who are looking to develop their faith, maybe, in your community. So this paradigm assumes variable levels of skill, participation, and investment on the part of the people who interact with your community to develop their faith. And it recognizes a key purpose of church, which is to develop faith practitioners. One of the wonderful things about being Episcopalian is that we view faith uh, as both a belief and a practice. Like we do our faith, we practice it in particular ways. And so part of the purposes of church is to equip people to be practitioners of faith, uh, to give them the skills and the practices to go deeper and deeper with God. Uh, another part of being Episcopalian is that we believe that happens best and, and uh, most truly in community. So there's a particular way that your church, that your place has of equipping people to be practitioners of Christian faith. Um, and this model will help us figure out both how to know what that way is um, or how to know more about it and how people who are interacting with you are developing their faith in community. A practitioner paradigm perceives value and giftedness at all levels of practice. Um, so if I were doing a different kind of practice, like for example, a yoga practice, um, a yoga teacher would hopefully, I would stay around a yoga studio where I was treated like I had value, um, even if I didn't know how to do a sun salutation yet. Um, or where I was treated as if I had value and giftedness if I was really, really deep into my yoga practice. 
Um, this helps us to see people interacting with our church um, as valuable and as gifts to us, uh, no matter their level of skill um, or um, practice in Christian faith. And it also encourages us to meet people where they are and invite them to go deeper. And that's a key concept of this model that I'm going to say a few times. Uh, if you remember one thing, that's the thing I want you to remember. So let's look at it. <laughs> it looks like a bullseye. Um, it's a model uh, that is um, about moving toward the center. And there are different rings that uh, describe different ways that people are interacting with congregations um, for the purpose of developing their faith. So, in the outer ring out here, we have people who are vicariously connected. These are the people who, um, who go to your church, but not for Sunday. Uh, they're aware of your church. Um, and when they say, when someone asks them, for example, do you go to church, and they say no, they are picturing you in church in their mind. <laughs> and they say, I don't go to church. Uh, your church is the church that your vicariously connected people don't go to. So they might interact with your church in a number of other ways. Uh, I think of, at my place, we have a community garden uh, in the back. About an acre of our land is a community garden space specifically for uh, refugee and immigrant families um, who are recently arrived from farming cultures. And so they can, for about $30 a year, uh, which covers water, uh, farm a 300 square foot plot of land. They, most of them, a few of them are part of our congregation, but most of them are vicariously connected, um, being that they, um, they come and they garden, sometimes around on Sunday mornings, but they're in the backyard gardening. Uh, and um, nonetheless, they are, they are using our church to develop their faith, their relationship with God, with the earth, to feed their families. Uh, they belong to us, according to this model. Um, and we get to view them as a gift um, and as part of our community. In a little bit, we have occasional attenders, um, which is uh, often called uh, C and E, which stands for Christmas, Christmas and Easter. Easter. That's right. The big idea with occasional attenders is that they come once or twice a year. It doesn't have to be for Christmas and Easter. Uh, there's uh, one of the occasional attenders at my church comes, um, she comes on Christmas Eve and Mother's Day. She comes with her mom on Mother's Day every year. Um, occasional attenders, use your church as a place where they develop their faith at least once or twice a year. Um, they are part of your community in that way. Um, and when I think about them, um, I think about how most of them have really wonderful reasons for not being there more often. Right? There's a tendency with occasional attenders uh, sometimes to just wish that they just would come more. Right? Um, but uh, they have good reasons for doing that, and they're reliable, usually. Um, they come for big days. Your place is the place they go for one or two big days that are important and meaningful to them in a year. Further in, we have Sunday Sacramentalists. The way that I drew it has it as the biggest ring because it, this is where most of your people live. Um, and they are folks that have a regular pattern of attendance. These days, I define a regular pattern of attendance as anything more than two times a year. So if they come three times a year, four times a year, they are, they are flirting with Sunday sacramentalism. They are uh, having a regular pattern. I have one, uh, one person who I would call a Sunday sacramentalist at, at my place who literally comes once a quarter. And when she does, uh, last time she was there, uh, I was looking at Facebook after, and she had checked in at St. Columba's and said, now I'm home. For her, our place is home, even though she comes once a quarter uh, to worship there. This ring goes all the way into people who are coming every Sunday. Right? Sunday sacramentalists uh, have some pattern of regularity, and uh, they are actively pursuing their faith in some way, and the place, the primary place that they do it, is your church. They might, they might be serving in leadership, they might be very busy and involved uh, in governance or in volunteer activities at your church, um, uh, or they might just be coming on Sunday 
with some kind of a regular pattern. Then here in the, in the very middle, we have uh, the mature practitioners. I put MP, which I guess I taught this once in Canada, and that means a totally different thing. Um, something about part of it? Oh. Yeah, good. So um, that's not what that, that is, mature practitioners. All this means is that these are the people who are mature in practicing their faith the way that your church does it. And that's what I love about the center ring, is that it is the place where we find out what that unique and special way your place has of developing faith. Right, so every church has uh, its own way of being a community in the eyes of God and getting closer to God together. They have different charisms. So, you know, a church that has an Anglo-Catholic spirituality might be full of mature practitioners who gather before uh, the main service to um, pray in front of the Mary Shrine uh, or who spend a lot of time um, revering the sacrament. What's that called? Benediction. Right? Uh, I should know what that's called. Um, they, they, their mature practitioners are going to find a lot of meaning in that particular way of being. Um, when I uh, first got to my congregation, uh, that was the first question I had: is where are the mature practitioners, and what do they do? What are what are the things that they do that are going to reveal to me Saint Columba's particular way of developing faith? And what I learned after I kind of got a hunch around who maybe they were uh, was that for my place, it had a lot to do with uh, guitar music, uh, things that were related in some way to Curcio, um, with uh, um, they wanted to pray in ways that reveal emotion uh, and that allow for emotion and for um, you know, invisible emotion, crying. Um, and they do a little bit, we want more, um, their, their physical expressions in worship tend to be a little different. Um, I, like some people cross themselves and so forth, but uh, they want to lay hands a lot, and um, and they want to be able to put their hands in the air um, while singing, just every once in a while. It's not it's not extreme. Uh, and so the mature practitioners they know how to develop their faith in your place, particularly. They've usually been there a while. Uh, they might show up at midweek services on a regular basis. They might not always be the top, most visible leaders and coordinators of things. They might not always be the nicest people. Um, sometimes they're quite eccentric. Um, there could be crazy weirdos in any of these rings. Um, and one of the things I'm thinking about is my mature practitioners who are difficult is like, how much more difficult would they be if they didn't know how to draw close to God in the particular way that our place does it? They're also the magnetic center. Um, if you pay attention to where and what mature practitioners are up to in your place um, and let other rings have access to that, they will draw people in um, because they're the core. They're the core of how faith is practiced in the way that your place practices its faith. So why do we do this? Why go to all the trouble of figuring out uh, how people interact and at what level? Um, well, we do it so we can kind of take a snapshot of a particular church and understand it better. And then figure out ways to meet each of these rings where they are, even the middle, and invite them to go deeper in their practice of faith in the way that your community practices faith. So I want to show you how to do the map. There's nothing on the map yet. So the first thing you do, if you want to take a snapshot of your place um, to sort of figure out where the numbers are, where people, um, who, who is here, the first thing you do is uh, acknowledge that anything that you say is pretty much a guess. Okay. So uh, you start by estimating the number of mature practitioners. And that's really, it's just an estimation. Um, so 
So say, for example, you have a church with um, uh, about an average Sunday attendance of 100. I'm going to do my best to make this as easy as possible. Um, you might estimate, you might know that there's, maybe there's 10. 10 mature practitioners. You might come up with that number a variety of ways. Uh, you might sit down and think, like, who is it that really knows how to develop their, play, their faith in the way we practice faith here? Um, you might look at uh, who comes to sort of mature practitioner focused events and things. Who's, who's going to Bible study? Who's coming to midweek services, um, et cetera? So say you have 10 mature practitioners. To figure out the Sunday Sacramentalists, you're going to take your ASA, and that stands for Average Sunday Attendance. It's uh, an acronym you're going to hear a lot as you interact with the college. You take your ASA minus mature practitioners, which equals Sunday people. So if your ASA equals 100, and you decided you have 10 mature practitioners, and you've got somewhere in the area of 90. My math checker says that was correct. <laughs> <laughs> so for occasional attenders, you can take either your Christmas or your Easter attendance. Um, so let's say you take Christmas and then minus the average Sunday attendance. So say you have 200 people on Christmas then you can estimate you've got somewhere in the area of 100 so, uh, okay. occasional attenders. Occasional attenders. And then, for vicariously connected, a number is not that important. The most important thing for the vicariously connected people is to know who they are, to come up with some sort of idea of who is touching your place in some way or another without being there on a Sunday morning. So, some examples of this might be um, AA meetings that, that meet at your place. Or uh, is there a school that is there? Um, for us, our community gardeners, we have two neighborhood councils that meet in our space um, and uh, are becoming more and more involved neighborhood councils, um, so things like that, quilting groups, or Boy Scout troops, or um, um, preschool parents, um, neighbors who walk their dogs through our property is a vicariously connected group um, that we have at St. Columbus, uh, as well as uh, people who um, take their children to the park across the street and see our place um, and interact with it in that way. We have a homeless shelter that uh, spends uh, two to four months a year in our parish hall. Those are all vicariously connected people, as well as everyone who visits our food bank um, a couple times a week. So once you've identified uh, sort of who, who is here, you can start asking questions. Um, like, how do we treat the people in each one of these rings? Um, do we treat them like a gift? Do we treat them like they belong? Um, like they are a part of us? Uh, especially, I think, with vicariously connected and occasional offenders. Um, do we greet our vicariously connected uh, people with the same sort of enthusiasm um, and joy uh, as we do people on Sunday morning? Uh, are we equipping these two inner rings to interact in ways that are joyful and welcoming uh, and open? Uh, or Sometimes resentment can build in the center toward the people that only come on Christmas and Easter, or toward the people who come and use the food bank but never come to church. Right? Um, we can sort of ask, are there healthy numbers of people in all of the rings? The goal is not to get everybody to the middle. Right? If everyone was inside the middle, that would be, if everyone was a mature practitioner in a faith community, that would be what we would call a cult. Um, because it would be the very definition of an impermeable boundary, right? If the only way to be part of your community was to be a mature practitioner, you'd have to get pretty aggro about 
membership <laughs> rights and rituals, <laughs> at the very least. Um, another, another question to ask once you're looking at this is, is there a healthy number of people in the middle? Um, I remember talking uh, to a priest who had been at, at her congregation for, I think, maybe, I don't know, some number of months, and she was using this model, and she realized that they didn't have any mature practitioners. There was no one. Um, and it was a church that was in a summer vacation spot, so it would swell in the summertime, and then um, everyone would leave, and there'd be this corp of people left. Um, there was nobody in there. Um, and so her next developmental move was to try to get herself in the middle, at the very least. So you start asking kind of these questions of the model. Some, some takeaways and questions to ask. First of all, your church has a unique and particular way of developing faith and community. It's one of the big takeaways of this model. There is, there is a particular way that your place develops Christians, develops people who are practitioners of Christian faith. And that's a good thing to get curious about and to figure out. Next, what areas are sparse or overly populated? Um, I can think of a congregation here in our diocese that at least for a while um, was really, really buzzy and had a huge vicariously connected ring. People would come from all over the place to just visit them one time. Um, and struggle baby with some of these. Right. So what, what areas are sparse or populated in the model? This is a great question to ask. Leader, where are you? Where would you put yourself? What this lifts up for me is that this is not a description of how mature any one person is in their practice of Christian faith. It is a description of where, how, they, how mature they are and where they develop that faith. So clergy especially, it is really tough to become a mature practitioner in a place that's also your workplace, uh, your source of income, and we don't always get to pick to go to a church whose ethos, practice, and uh, particular way of being church fits all our preferences. And we can't just be like, well, you don't, you don't have incense, and I like incense, so I'm going to go to another church. Um, so, leader, where are you? And I think one of the most important developmental tasks of leadership is to try to figure out how to get yourself in the middle, how to get next to those mature practitioners and figure out how to do what they do. And then what or where are the potential invitations or blocks to going deeper? So how are you meeting your people, all of your people, where they are? And how are you opening doors or gateways uh, into the next room? You can't make anybody go deeper with us in their practice of Christian faith. Uh, but I think we can probably stop them uh, from going deeper if we try. Uh, so start asking, how do we, how do we open doors? Um, with vicariously connected people, uh, do they have positive experiences of our space? Uh, are they welcomed? Is our, does our place look nice? Like a place you might want to walk into? Um, if your group meets there, do they come into rooms that are messy? Uh, are they chastised if they, if they don't keep things perfectly clean? Like, how, how do you interact with them? Are they able to tell when worship services are just by passing the building? Um, with occasional attenders, uh, how do you treat them when they show up? Do you save your most complicated music for Christmas Eve when all of your visitors want to sing Silent Night? Um, are you intentionally welcoming and joyful in how you preach on Christmas and Easter? Um, are you helping your congregation see all of the strangers that come on that day as a gift, um, as a sign of God's blessing and fullness? Um, with your Sunday sacramentalists, do they know mature practitioners? Do they have opportunities to get, make friendships with them? Um, do, do you have events or formation opportunities um, that form natural connections between those groups? And with your mature practitioners, are you nurturing them? Do you pay attention to them? There can be a temptation, I think, to think that they're fine because they are mature in their practice. They don't always need a lot of attention, but they're the magnetic center. Uh, if you don't feed them and care for them, if you don't put your light, your leadership light on that center, um, 
It won't be visible to others either. So where, what and where are the potential invitations or blocks to going deeper? This is a really powerful tool. It's one of my very favorite models to use. Uh, it was one of the models my first, I would say, two years at St. Columba's. Um, this was one of the two models that I always had in the back of my head um, when thinking about interacting with people. Uh, in part because I wanted to be a mature practitioner there, but also I wanted my congregation uh, to learn how to greet every human that touched our place um, with joy and as if, as if God had sent them to us, um, because that's what I believe to be true. But it is not a model um, that can be used without intention. So how do we use this model? We definitely use it for assessment and diagnosis. I think when you're working with leaders, you can do this math and start conversations around how to open doorways between those rings. Um, start to look for where leader energy should go and diagnose how, how to get that energy there. I would not use it for teaching and formation. Um, especially the center, mature practitioner, it describes a very specific thing uh, and it could easily be misunderstood. And so I wouldn't necessarily have an adult forum or you know, like a series of discipleship groups on this model. It's good for data collection. I'll put a caveat on there. Um, it's the kind of data collection that leaders do with their own data. So I wouldn't necessarily throw this up in front of the congregation and be like, everybody go put a dot where you think you are. Um, or, you know, go put a dot where you think the person sitting next to you is. <laughs> I, would, I would say I use this the most to collect data that I have inside of me already uh, that I need to get out somehow or with a small group of leadership. So I might sit down with the model and say, who are my mature practitioners? This model helps me think that through. What are they up to? Sometimes they change their behavior. <laughs> and and I, I notice, oh, like some of them are doing a different thing. What is that about? What is that revealing or telling me about my congregation right now? Um, it is not very helpful for development of common language. It's just not one of those tools. Um, it is OK if most of your congregation doesn't know what a vicariously connected person is. It's wonderful for leadership and strategy, especially making decisions around where to put energy um, as a leader. And it's good for direction, vision, and goals. Um, one thing that I think most of my leadership and, and, and a good chunk of my congregation would say sounds familiar to them is the phrase, meet them where they are, and invite them to go deeper. Um, and uh, that is really a direction and vision statement. It's how we want to interact with the world. Right? This model is helpful for doing that. Anything I missed? I've, just, I've always loved how you've um, said that our job is to meet people where they are and invite them to go deeper, but God, <laughs> but God is the one who moves on. Absolutely, absolutely. We can't make anyone go deeper in faith with us. Um, but I do believe uh, that God is calling people to my congregation, to your congregation, uh, and um, it's our job to land them, to notice them, and uh, to welcome them into, into practice of faith. Thank you. <laughs> I am Alyssa Newton, and this has been Faith Development in Community.